Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 712, and today is November 15th, 2024. I'm the host of the show, Kyle Anslone. A lot of news to wrap up the week here. We're going to be talking about the wars going on in the Middle East and Ukraine. Big stories, big stories coming out of both, uh, both wars that, that we really need to get into. So be sure to share today's show. It's hosted at the Libertarian Institute, reposted on the blog at antiwar.com. Video version of the show is at YouTube, Rumble, and Odyssey. Just be sure to hit the subscribe button at wherever you're watching the show. If you'd like to listen to the podcast, it's up anywhere you could listen to audio podcasts. And of course, follow me on Twitter, where we just broke 7,000 followers this week and gaining a lot of momentum, a lot of steam on Twitter. So head on over and follow me there if you can. And I post everything that gets discussed in this show, articles that I write, news that I think is important, episodes of this show, all that goes up on my Twitter feed. So it's a great place to keep up with everything that I do uh, in, in one source. All right. Let's start here. Ukrainian advisory group report says Kiev could develop nukes within months. So a report from the head of Ukraine's National Institute for Strategic Studies, which is a government research center that acts as an advisory body to the presidential office, the National Security and the Defense Councils of Ukraine, said Kiev could develop nuclear weapons within months. So this was reported by the Times of London. Quote, Ukraine could develop a rudimentary nuclear bomb within months if Donald Trump withdraws U.S. military assistance, according to a briefing paper today prepared for the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. And so it's really important to understand that while this document was not written by an official government source, it was commissioned by the government and it was written by somebody who advises the Ukrainian government. So there, there's two things here. One, this is actually something that Ukraine may want to do and something that the Ukrainian are considering. Two, if you listen to that first paragraph, I think it maybe gives away a little bit of the game that this is a met as a, essentially a threat to Donald Trump that says, hey, if you back out of military support, we could go nuclear. Now, I don't think that will work the way that the Ukrainians wanted to, and we'll get into that as we go along here. But I, I do think that is potentially the purpose of this paper and that Ukraine really isn't planning to make nuclear weapons. So uh, the Times article says the country would be able to build a basic nuclear device from plutonium with technology similar to Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The report says creating a simple atomic bomb, as the United States did within the framework of the Manhattan Project, would not be a difficult task 80 years later. So with no time to build large facilities required to enrich uranium, wartime Ukraine would have to rely instead on using plutonium extracted from spent fuel rods taken from Ukraine's nuclear reactors. And Ukraine does have a fairly substantial nuclear energy program, and so I would imagine that, that they would have some amount of that material to, to take and use. So I, I don't think this paper is just making that part up. Uh, back to the article, the paper, which was published for the S Center for Army Conversion and Disarmament Studies. So this is important, right? This not only was the paper commissioned for the Defense Department, but was also published within the, the Ukrainian government and an influential Ukrainian military think tank has been shared with the country's deputy defense minister and is to be presented on Wednesday at a conference likely to be attended by Ukraine's ministers for defense and strategic industries. While the report is not endorsed by the Kiev government, but it does set out a legal basis under which Ukraine could withdraw from the nonproliferation treaty. So the author of the report believes the threshold for developing nuclear uh, rearmament program would be Putin's troops reaching the city of Polovahrad, a military industrial hub about 60 miles from the present front lines. Any further from there, and there would be a serious risk of some of Ukraine's largest cities, including Dnipro and Kharkiv, could fall before the weapon was developed. So this is something that could happen relatively soon, uh, certainly in 2025, if Ukraine keeps losing territory at the rate that they're losing territory. And so this is a big deal. And if, you know, Trump were to cut off weapons and the Ukrainians would decide to keep fighting, then they would likely, you know, um, 
lose this territory even faster, which would mean they would be, you know, forced to make the decision on the nuclear weapon even faster, uh, assuming that the point of the report is really considering uh, about developing nuclear weapons. And so before we finish the article here, there's just a couple more points I wanted to make. One, again, I don't know if this is meant to be a threat to the Kremlin or a threat to the incoming White House, but it, it's meant to be a threat, I think, to one or the other. Um, if it's a threat towards Putin, I think it's a very bad and dangerous play. And even if it's threat to the a White House, if it's misread by the Kremlin as a threat to Moscow, then it's still a really bad play. I think this is one of the few things that would push Putin to start taking out uh, and just, you know, kind of carpet bombing Kiev or something like that would in other Ukrainian cities would be if he thought Ukraine was trying to develop a nuclear weapon. Putin has been pretty clear during his decades in office now that the one thing he really draws red lines around is, you know, nuclear weapons present close to Russian borders. That's why he's been so opposed to the Aegis Ashore uh, systems in Poland and Romania, which we'll talk about next. And it, I don't think it's any coincidence that just weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, Zelensky was floating, revoking the Budapest Memorandum, which would ne wasn't necessarily a direct call saying that we're going to re uh, start making our nuclear weapons, but certainly suggested that he could. All right, so this next quote from the author of the report I think is really important. And it's really important because if this is the thinking in Kiev, then we have problems. So the, the report says, I was surprised by the reverence the United States has for Russia's nuclear threat. It may have cost us the war. They treat nuclear weapons as some kind of god, so perhaps it's also time for us to pray to this god. And now look. I think there is a reasonable reason to treat nuclear weapons as some sort of god because, kind of like a god, they are capable of wiping out life on this planet. And so to make a top priority avoiding nuclear war and not wanting to cross Russian red lines that could potentially lead to a nuclear war are obvious interests of the United States and its Western backers. And so... If this is the thinking in Kiev, though, that it was the Russian nuclear threat that lost them the war and that the solution is now to develop their no own nuclear arsenal, I, look, I think it's essentially a suicidal mission. I, I think it's going to result in fire being rained down on Ukraine like we have not seen so far in this conflict. But, I mean... This is really great. They're, they're talking about developing a nuclear weapon and then dropping it on Russian territory. I mean, this is a massive provocation. And I do think we will end up seeing some kind of Russian reaction just to this report being produced. And certainly if it's not immediately downplayed by Zelensky and his Western backers. So the Ukraine's foreign ministry said it had no plans to develop nuclear weapons and stressed its commitment to the NPT. So that's good. But Again, they just produced their support, so that raises major questions. Now, this is also happening at the same time where the U.S. is opening a provocative military uh, missile base in Poland. And this is an article I wrote for the Libertarian Institute on November 14th. After nearly two decades, President George W. Bush's plan to put the Aegis Ashore missile system in Poland was achieved this week. The system is capable of firing offensive missiles and is viewed as a serious national security threat by Russia. Russia. The base is located in Rezyskow, northern Poland, near the Baltic coast. During, uh, during the base's opening ceremony, the Polish president, Duda, said the world will see clearly that this is not Russia's sphere of interest anymore. From the Polish point of view, this is strategically the most important thing. So since the base was announced by Bush, Washington has asserted that the purpose of installing the missile defense system in Poland and a second in Romania was to prevent Europe from an Iranian missile attack, but due to statement really gives away that this is about Russia. So 
while they claim that this is meant as a defensive system, the launchers that fire the Aegis interceptors can also fire offensive Tomahawk missiles. Previously, the U.S. fielded a variant of the Tomahawk that was capable of delivering a nuclear warhead. The Kremlin views the presence of the launchers in Eastern Europe as a strategic threat to Russia. As the base was under planning and construction, Russian President Vladimir Putin pressed multiple American presidents not to deploy the Aegis systems to Poland and Romania. The Polish foreign minister noted during the opening ceremonies, governments changed in the United States and Poland since this base was created. This base is a monument not only to the Polish-American alliance, it's the stability, but also the Polish-Polish alliance. So, Moscow argued that the system's MK-41 launchers violated the INF Treaty, which was a bilateral arms control path between the U.S. and Russia. The treaty explicitly outlawed the deployment of intermediate-range land-based offensive missile launchers, the MK-41 campfire tomahawks. During the first Donald Trump presidency, Washington unilaterally left the INF Treaty. And so it's no longer... You know, the treaty is no longer in place and the U.S. was doing this in violation of the treaty anyways. However, when we see Washington take steps to violate even defunct missile or arms control agreements with Russia, Russia does take countermeasures. And this is in part because Russia doesn't respond to the U.S. leaving the INF treaty by immediately going and doing things that violate the INF treaty. They say, well, we could stay within the confines of this agreement, or they will try to stay within portions of the confines of the agreement in case a new American administration that comes in that is willing to agree with to arms control and we could re-enter and salvage part of the agreement. Now, obviously, that didn't happen under the Biden administration. Uh, after the Trump administration left these agreements, they just continued to, uh, you know, develop these weapons that are outside of the agreements, go ahead with the Aegis Assured deployment. And so I could see Russia taking, you know, measures to deploy intermediate range missiles in land-based systems so somewhere within Russian territory. So while the Aegis system has created significant friction between Russia and NATO, Warsaw also wants to expand the missile base. Polish defense minister explained on Monday that the scope of the shield needs to be expanded. So they're, as soon as they're done with the first one, they're already talking about more. All right, next up here, Human Rights Watch Israel guilty of crimes against humanity in Gaza. So a report from Human Rights Watch concludes, Israeli authorities have caused the massive deliberate forced displacement of Palestinian civilians in Gaza since October 2023 and are responsible for war crimes and crimes against humanity. There is no plausible imperative military justification to justify Israel's mass displacement of nearly all of Gaza's population, often multiple times. The Israeli evacuation systems have severely harmed the population and often only serve to spread fear and anxiety rather than ensure the security for displaced civilians. Israeli forces have repeatedly struck designated evacuation routes and safe zones. Evacuation orders have been inconsistent, inaccurate, and frequently not communicated with two civilians with enough time to allow for evacuations or at all. The others did not consider the need of people with disabilities and others who are unable to leave without assistance. Authorities have blocked all but a small fraction of the necessary humanitarian aid, water, electricity, and fuel from reaching the civilians in Gaza. Israeli attacks have damaged and destroyed resources that people need to stay alive, including hospitals, schools, water, and emergency infrastructure, bakeries, and agricultural land. Israel's military has intentionally demolished or severely damaged civilian infrastructure, including controlled demolition of homes, with the apparent aim of creating an extended buffer zone along Gaza's perimeter with Israel and corridors to bifurcate Gaza. The destruction is so substantial that it indicates the intention to permanently displace many peoples. Human Rights Watch found that displacement has been widespread and the evidence shows it has been systematic and part of a state policy. Such acts also constitute crimes against humanity. The Israeli authorities organize violent displacement of Palestinians in Gaza who are members of another ethnic group is 
also likely planned to be permanent in the buffer zone and security corridors. Such actions of Israeli authorities amount to ethnic cleansing. So that is a very strong indictment from a very prominent American human rights organization. I doubt it's going to impact the White House or the policy, but things like this are going to be used in the future to talk about, you know, what America was like during this time and is going to say, you know, we we aided and abetted a genocide. Even their most uh, prominent human rights organizations were screaming it to the American people and the government and nobody did anything. Uh, and then we also had this one here from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com. UN committee says Israel is carrying out a genocide. So on Thursday, a report published by the UN uh, Special UN Committee said Israel's actions in Gaza are consistent with the characteristics of a genocide. The UN report released by the UN Special Committee to investigate Israeli practices said Israel has used criminal means to achieve its military goals, including using the starva starvation as a weapon. The report says this includes intentionally causing death, starvation, great suffering, and serious injury, using starvation as a method of warfare, and intentionally directing attacks at civilians. The committee, which was formed in 1968, also discussed the Occupy West Bank, where it said Israel has an apartheid system of justice. The report said the killing and serious bodily injury or mental harm caused to Palestinians in Gaza and the Occupy West Bank, including East Jerusalem, are violations under hum, uh, international law. All right, so let's talk uh, about the amount of aid getting into Gaza. We had last month the U.S. government tell Israel that they need to start allowing more aid into Gaza. Now that deadline has passed, and it's confirmed that the U.S. isn't going to do anything. So U.S. confirms Israel will face no consequences for not improving the aid situation. The Biden administration said Tuesday it will not limit weapons transfers to Israel, despite Israel's failure to meet U.S. demands to increase aid levels in in Gaza amid the starvation blockade and ethnic cleansing campaign in northern Gaza. The administration sent a letter to Israeli officials on October 13th, giving Israel 30 days to allow more aid into Gaza, but it not, did not explicitly say there would be consequences. Tuesday marked the end of the 30-day deadline, and Israel didn't come close to meeting the U.S. demands. The State Department said it wouldn't change any policies towards Israel, confirming the letter was nothing more than a pre-election public relations ploy. The letter said Israel must increase aid deliveries to 350 trucks per day, but the State Department spokesman, Vedant Patel, claimed the U.S. didn't even know how many trucks had entered the Strip in the last 30 days. The U.N. says it had only received 39 trucks per day since the beginning of October, which are the lowest levels of the war, by the way. So the U.S. sent this letter. Israel decreased, not increased, decreased aid to Gaza, and there are no consequences. I mean... You know, this is just the most pathetic thing I have ever seen from a U.S. administration where they're they're setting lines, red lines with allies that they're not even pretending that they're going to enforce, even when the ally makes no effort whatsoever to meet the criteria. You, they send the letter. There's 80 trucks entering Gaza per day in September. That increases to 100 trucks per day. It's trivial, but at least it's in the right direction. It's not going to dramatically improve the situation or even improve the situation in Gaza is going to make the situation uh, get worse less quickly, but in a very marginal way. And Israel won't even take that step. They're actually cutting aid in half or maybe even more in October versus September. And the U S is demanding they were giving more. So it, it's just, it's so pathetic that we are supposed to be the world empire. We got this massive $1 trillion military, and we can't even get Israel to allow a few aid trucks to enter into Gaza. Um, so Patel also claimed that Israel took some steps to improve the situation, but a group said on Tuesday that the situation in Gaza has only gotten worse since the U.S. letter was sent and that the aid levels are at the lowest point of the war. So aid organizations said Israel not only failed to meet the U.S. criteria that would indicate support for the humanitarian response, but concurrently took actions that dramatically worsened the situation on the ground, particularly in northern, northern Gaza. Patel also claimed that Israel's conduct is not in violation of U.S. foreign 
foreign assistance laws that prohibit military aid to countries that commit human rights abuses and purposely block humanitarian aid. The Biden administration has ignored hundreds of reports of U.S. weapons being used by Israel to kill civilians unnecessarily inside Gaza, and of course that number is probably thousands and it's only hundreds because Israel has killed all the journalists and has made it really hard for these reports of American weapons being used to slaughter civilians to get outside of the Strip. So the U.S. military aid is enabling Israel's ethnic cleansing campaign, which has cut northern Gaza in half as Israeli forces are focusing on cleansing the cities of Jabalia, Bet Halan, and Bet Lahaini. There are where no aid has been allowed since early October. Israeli media has acknowledged that the ethnic cleansing campaign is on and the military has said it won't allow Palestinian residents to return to their homes, which are being destroyed. Without U.S. military aid, Israel won't be able to continue its genocidal war. A senior Israeli Air Force official recently acknowledged that without U.S. support, Israel couldn't sustain operations in Gaza for more than a few months. So... That's that's bad news, and it's likely to get any better anytime soon. And there's the next two stories. Uh, I explain that Qatar says it's suspended role as mediator between Israel and Hamas. So Qatar's foreign ministry announced on Saturday that Doha has suspended its role as mediator between Israel and Hamas, citing a lack of progress in Gaza hostage and ceasefire negotiations. So the foreign ministry statement explained the state of Qatar notified the parties ten days ago during the last attempt to reach an agreement that it would stall its efforts that would stall its efforts to mediate between Hamas and Israel if an agreement was not reached in that round. The statement came in response to reports that Qatar had ended its role as mediator altogether and agreed with the U.S. request to expel Hamas officials who are based in Doha. The Qatari foreign ministry said the reports were not accurate. I've read that Hamas is being relocated to Turkey and so so interesting being kid from one U.S. Middle East ally to another. Uh, we'll see if the Turks have any more luck with negotiations. But Turkey seems to have an even worse relationship with Israel than Qatar does. So I think that's unlikely. We also have this report here. That suggests we're not going to have any ceasefire anytime in 2025. Israeli military planning to stay in Gaza through 2025. The Israeli military is planning to stay in Gaza through 2025 and is stepping up demolitions and the construction of more permanent military structures, Haaretz said on Wednesday. There is a significant portion of Gaza's territory that is under control of the Israeli military, where the IDF has been destroying every building in a in sight and establishing military outposts, including the Nazarene Corridor, a strip of land that separates northern Gaza from the rest of the Strip. According to Haaretz, the Nazarene Corridor is currently 5 to 6 kilometers wide and about 9 kilometers long. The Israeli military is working to expand it even more. Today, when you stand on the road in some places, you no longer see any houses. An Israeli combat soldier said of the corridor, which includes uh, the former site of a Jewish settlement which I think was called the Nazarene Settlement, which is why they call it the Nazarene Corridor. So the Israeli military has conducted similar destruction along the Philadelphia Corridor, which is on the Gaza-Egypt border, and in a buffer zone along the entire Israel-Gaza border that cuts at least one kilometer into Gaza's territory. In those areas as well, virtually all the buildings have been destroyed and the military outposts are going up. Haaretz previously reported that the Nazarene Corridor, the Philadelphia corridor and the buffer zone account for 26% or a quarter of Gaza's territory, which, by the way, was one of the most densely populated on Earth prior to the bombardment. In northern Gaza, Israel is currently conducting ethnic cleansing campaigns focused on cities um, in the north, which have been completely cut off from aid deliveries as the Israeli military is starving the civilian population. Israeli forces are are also demolishing buildings in the northern cities, so the expelled Palestinians have nowhere to return. The ethnic cleansing campaign and the conquering of Gaza's territories is expected to pave the way for Jewish settlements in Gaza and, it, you know, ultimately the removal of all the Palestinians. So this is uh, really concerning. Also, there is the West Bank, which, which could also be annexed under the Trump administration. 
Uh, this one from Dave DeCamp. Israeli settlement minister wants West Bank annexation. No voting or land rights for the Palestinians. So the Israeli minister of settlements and national missions, Orit Strzok, has said that he said she's working to ensure Israel can annex much of the land in the West Bank as possible during the incoming Trump administration, but said that the Palestinians that live there don't have the rights to the land and shouldn't have the right to vote. So she told Israeli media, according to Middle East Eye, my office is working to full throttle to ensure that if sovereignty annexation is implied uh, is applied, it will cover the maximum possible area. When asked what will happen to the Palestinians who live in the occupied territory, she said all people have human rights through the national law over the land belongs solely to the people of Israel. They can stay here as human beings, of course, and to be a Jewish state. We should grant them fuel human rights, in my view. When asked to clarify what rights the Palestinians she would have, natural rights over this land belong only to the Jewish people. I think the model needs to be found. They should be able to vote for the Knesset, I, I, but they shouldn't be able. They should not be able to vote for the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. So the Times of Israel report this week that Trump aides have cautioned Israeli ministers in recent months not to assume the president-elect is going to back Israel and that's in the West Bank. However, Trump's appointment of former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee as ambassador to Israel signals the administration will bat the annexation. My guess is that the Trump administration isn't going to be as uh, keen as the Biden administration has been about all the very provocative Israeli statements about annexing the West Bank, although they may allow Tel Aviv to eventually do so. I, I do think they will, by the way. That's That's been my prediction for some time, that during the Trump administration, probably in the latter half of it, we will see the annexation of the West Bank. All right, next up here, report Elon Musk met with Iran's UN ambassador to discuss easing tensions. So this was one of the crazier stories that we got on Thursday, and is one sign that the Trump administration is going to be hard to figure out. So the New York Times reported on Thursday that Elon Musk, an advisor to President-elect Donald Trump, met with Iran's ambassador to the United Nations on Monday. The report cited two unnamed Iranian officials who said the discussions lasted over an hour and was about how to defuse tensions between the U.S. and Iran. The Iranian source described the meetings as positive and good news. The reported meeting hasn't been confirmed publicly by any side. Stephen Chuang, Trump's communications director, told the Times, we do not comment on reports of private meetings that did or did not occur. Musk has been close to Trump since the strongly thrown support behind him during the presidential race and reportedly was involved in a recent call with the Ukrainian President Zelensky. Musk's SpaceX has played a crucial role in Ukraine's war effort by providing Starlink terminals and communication services to the Ukrainians. The Times report came after Trump announced most of his foreign policy team, which is also stacked with Iran Hawks. Trump took a hard line against Iran during his previous administration with the so-called maximum pressure campaign, which involved tearing up the Iran nuclear deal, imposing crippling economic sanctions on Tehran, and is assassinating Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. Trump's top cabinet pick, including Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Mike Waltz, our Repu- Re- Representative Mike Waltz wants to return to a maximum pressure campaign, and that's what Israel expects. Israel Hayam reported on Thursday that Trump's team is preparing plans to topple Iran's regime, a policy that would almost certainly mean war with Iran, but the report didn't offer any details about what the plan for regime change would involve. Uh, the that outlet is published by Miriam Adelson, the widow of the late casino magnate Sheldon Adelson, who donated $100 million to Trump's campaign to encourage him to ex- uh, pursue extremely pro-Israel policies, which means the news outlet is likely trying to influence Trump rather than actually reporting on Trump's policy. And so there's one other thing I want to break, talk about with this story. And this is something that I said when I've been discussing Trump's cabinet and while Marco Rubio may be the Secretary of State, it may be that he's 
fairly marginalized when it comes to what we consider foreign policy issues. I do think he's going to be heavily involved in Latin and South American foreign policy issues. But when it comes to the Middle East, China, Iran, well, so far, it seems like Elon Musk, who a lot of people speculated was kind of given a fake government job that or non-government job. So he was going to be outside the government with this, you know, doge uh, government agency that could be more of a meme than an actual thing. And yet he seems to be wielding far more influence than Rubio Waltz or anybody else who's been announced as a part of his foreign policy team. All right, last up here, Biden told Trump that Iran is the most immediate threat. So Newsweek reports President Joe Biden's administration warned presidential elect Donald Trump that Iran is the most immediate threat to national security in the White House meeting on Wednesday. And so after Trump gets that report, he apparently dispatches Elon Musk to talk to the Iranians. That's very interesting. Biden's security advisor, Jade Sullivan, told reporters escalating tensions in the Middle East due to the conflict in Gaza made the Tehran regime and its associated militia groups a continuing risk for the U.S. and its citizens. Sullivan said there's the most immediate issue, which is Iran and its proxy groups continue to take action that directly threaten Americans and American interests in the Middle East and has to be dealt with on an urgent basis. Now, aside from the Iran issue, and we talk a lot about this, so I don't, like, obviously that we know that the war in the Middle East could be easily unwound by forcing Israel to come to a ceasefire in Gaza, right? So it's an immediate issue, but it's a very quickly and easily resolvable issue. The more immediate issue, uh, of course, is the war in Ukraine, where the U.S. is on the brink of a nuclear war. That the White House doesn't assess that as their most immediate issue it is quite shocking and disturbing to me. So Anyways, that's where I'm going to wrap up the show for today, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in to all the shows we put out this week. We'll be back with more shows next week. I'm sure a lot more coverage on what this Trump administration is going to look like. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.